Hello, I'm Dee Dee Strum. Welcome to Trailblazers Impact Podcast with inspiring stories of women who created new paths for other women to follow. Our website is trailblazersimpact.com and you can contact us at hello at trailblazersimpact.com. Our uh, lineup of guests for Trailblazers Impact and on behalf of myself and my co-host uh, Nan McKay, again, I can't thank you enough. It's sort of amazing to me when I sit back and re- reflect on the way our friendship has developed over the years and to think about at least three of us that are Texan born and all ended up meeting here in the Hoosier state of, Indi- of Indiana and specifically Indianapolis, Indiana. And what I find interesting, and maybe it's just something in our Texas DNA, is that the three of us that found each other are all recognized as women leaders, activists, and advocates for human rights. Kathy, I'm just curious, uh, when I reflect on your age bracket uh, somewhere in the 70s and your childhood being that of a young girl in a southern state, a very southern state, Texas, which may have the image for most people of being the wild, wild west, when in reality it was just another state that was part of the segregated south. I'm curious as to the intersection of the influences of your childhood growing up in Texas as a young white girl, but in a very segregated and racially, highly racially charged atmosphere uh, of Texas versus now all of these decades later, your history um, of activism uh, on behalf of people of all colors, uh, all genders, uh, uh, people of of different sexual orientations, um, your fight for marriage equality. So it's like this juxtaposition of some a white girl from the deep south in a segregated state and then becoming this voice for equality. So there must have been some childhood influences. Well, the, yes, there certainly were. And I wish I could say that I was a liberal child. I was not a liberal child. I was a typical child of East Texas. Now, I did have one extraordinary experience over a lifetime, and that was that our maid or housekeeper was one of the key people in my life. And she stayed, the family was in contact with her at various times for the rest of her life. She and my mother were the exact same age and died within six months of each other. Uh, She visited me here several times. seemed to be keenly aware that she probably was the only person in the little southern town who figured out that I was gay. And she was so tickled when she finally got to meet my partner later and really liked her. So Lorraine Grigsby Grant was a huge influence throughout my life. Uh, I have to say, when I went away to college, my freshman year, I went to a southern girls' school, Mary Baldwin in Stanton, Virginia. It was a Presbyterian school. And I was one of the most bigoted freshmen in the class, in all probability. And they beat that out of me so fast and just said, these comments are not acceptable. I don't remember that I said that much, but it became obvious that I really thought perhaps that I was a little brighter than people of color. And... I got over that long before I got to, the next year I was at Southern Methodist. That was a totally segregated school, very, very Southern. It wasn't until I got to Indiana University in 1967 that I was in an integrated classroom. This was as a junior in college. You think about Brown versus the Board of Education in due haste. My school that I went to in Jasper and in Beaumont were not integrated during my times at those schools at all. So when you moved to Indiana, it was for to finish your your, your I your finished education? my finished my degree junior and senior year at IU Bloomington. I came because a the, my high school boyfriend went to Notre Dame, and we were just silly enough to think that Notre Dame and Bloomington were close. 
uh, not in Indiana roads. They weren't. By Texas roads, they would have been. But it took me all day on the Greyhound to get from Bloomington to South Bend. Um, it turns out that he was also gay and is still a dear friend of mine. And I adore his partner and still adore Tony. So that I came here just for Tony and ended up staying to do student teaching. I got my degree in history in 68, and my mother said I couldn't come home until I had a teaching certificate because my husband would probably leave me someday. Now, I don't know if that was a comment on my character or just her general view of life. Uh, so I stayed on and got my 15 hours of education credit and then did student teaching in Indianapolis. It's the first time I'd been to Indianapolis, maybe two or three times prior to that. And that's how I ended up in Indianapolis and have stayed here then the rest of my life. So, so now thinking of your um, experience, your first experience in teaching here in Indianapolis, were you teaching just all white children or did you, were you then introduced to uh, children of different races? as a result of being a teacher in, the, in, the, in an urban center. Right. Well, I had specialized in my graduate work in education in urban education. Oh. So I was hoping to get Wood, but it was in the time when they were getting ready to close Wood High School down. Um, I did in, teach in Manual, which had been recently integrated, and I discovered very quickly that I was not, I was a, I think a good teacher. I love the students. The faculty just left me with my mouth hanging open. They would sit in the faculty lounge and use the N-word with kids walking by the open door. Uh, the students, yes, there were, I had mixed classes and I can remember coming home on the bus one night and somebody was just making some comment to me and a young man in the back of the bus came straight up to me and he said that's my teacher you leave her alone <laughs> so you know I had wonderful experiences with the students I really enjoyed them but about that time I found out the library would hire people with undergraduate educations liberal arts educations and you could be called a pre-professional and you would if you got your master's within five years, then you could advance. Well, there were every, every reason in the world not to become a librarian. I had been kicked out of the town library when I was 12 for, it was also the community center, and so people could rent it, the hall next to the library for slumber parties. The librarian wouldn't let me read Leon Uris's Exodus but there was a friend who had a slumber party and I got in the library, spent all night reading Exodus and should have kept my mouth shut. But the next time I was in, I said, oh, Mrs. Aiden, I got to read Exodus after all. I was kicked out of the library for a month. Uh, so I did not have particularly, other than being a regular library user, I had some bad library experiences, but I did get a job at the public library as a paraprofessional, and it was like, why did I never consider this? This is heaven. I get to, it takes advantage of everything I'd read, everything I'd listened to, everything I'd viewed, and the patrons would tell you what they enjoyed reading. And within six months, I had decided, went from aimless to I know exactly what I want to do in my life, and I want to be in charge of the collection and programming for this public library. Um, at that point, I got pretty, some people would say devious. I would just say focused. And I figured out exactly how I was going to get that job. I was going to volunteer for every committee. I was going to make sure I did the right kind of extracurricular things. I made sure I got to meet from the from the custodians, the book mender, the clerks, the librarians, and the director. I was determined. I don't know what would have happened if it hadn't worked out, but I did get it done in nine years. <laughs> so 
I got my master's within oh two and a half, and then soon soon after that, I was named the library the manager of the Irvington Branch Library and did that for about five years. And then one of my mentors retired, and she had the job I had dreamed of getting, which was head of the collection and head of programming. Toward the end, it turned out to also be head of the central library. But I was going to go to that point that I know that you became. Um, Head of the uh, Marion County Central Library, which was certainly a uh, an achievement, mm -hmm. and uh, <clears throat> I think you were the first woman. No, there had been a woman before, but they hadn't they hadn't had that position. The head of Central they had kept unfilled for about ten years. Right. So they're saying, but as that yeah, that when that position was established, right. As that title, you mm -hmm. were the first woman right. to hold right. that, that is, title. Correct? That is correct. Right. Yes. Yes. But I want to go back on a couple of things that you that you've just shared. One being, um, uh, I love the fact that you shared your strategy for getting to where you wanted to get to. Uh, one of the things we talk about with uh, with Trailblazers Impact is uh, a tagline that our stories are by for and about women, women who were determined to get to where they wanted to be. And if they came up against barriers, they didn't care if they had to go over it, under it, around it, or through it. Mm -hmm. And I love the way you laid out the, the step by step in your mind, the things you had to do. So thank you for sharing with our <laughs> listening audience uh, exactly how you did that. Because I think that those kinds, one, the, the thought that you put into first defining where you wanted to mm -hmm. land, mm -hmm. what your end game was. Secondly, what kinds of things you were going to have to do to get noticed uh, in order to position yourself for right. it, and then finally landing it. Mm -hmm. And then from there, it became the launch pad for you to become a lot the, the, yeah, the, the, right, the director of the of Central uh, the central Library for right. Marion County. Right. Where along the way did you pick up your activism around um, civil rights, human rights, women's rights? Because I know that your past also includes the fact that you were chair of the Indiana Civil Liberties Union, mm -hmm. uh, and you chaired that organization for a number of years. You were also the chair of the mayor's task force that I felt think the title had to do with LGBTQ mm -hmm. or something. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about then your volunteerism right. and your activism okay. uh, through the uh, Indiana Civil Liberties Union, which mm -hmm. is a part of the American Civil Liberties right. Union. And I know you're still a strong supporter, even though you're no longer the, the chair of the right. state Indiana right. Civil Liberties Union. Um, once I was in charge, once I was downtown in the central office and I was given the opportunity by my boss just just saying, I want you to get involved in these organizations. Part of it was just an outreach by the library to let people know, neighborhood organizations. And he also, this is, I can't imagine this happening in the world today, but I remember coming to him and telling I'd spent too much on a particular speaker series. And he said, Kathy, my job your job is to think of ideas and execute them. My job is to find the money for them. So he said, I don't want you worrying about the money. And then at the same time, he had gotten on the bandwagon for adult literacy. And I remember being very oh, blunt and said, look, you want a literacy program? I can give you the largest adult literacy program in the state in one year. And we did it and trained. We had training sessions weekend after weekend. And it's now called, it was the Greater Indianapolis Literacy League. And now it's Indie Reads, which is independent from the library. Uh, but they still have offices at the library. And the library is very supportive of tutoring space and supplies and uh, materials that the students can use. Uh, and I guess overall, that's probably one of my, it gave me a chance to meet people who were not community leaders. The volunteers just came from every background. They really, it's like reading meant so much to them, and they wanted to be able to share that. And the students were wonderful. There was nothing wrong with their, they certainly didn't have any IQ issues. They had figured out how to cope in this society without being able to read. 
I can remember one young man was telling me about public radio and see, and what was on PBS and how he, and of course, by this time you had audio books and all kinds of things that people could listen to and get the information, but they wanted to be able to learn how to read. And a frequent request was wanting to be able to read at church. You know, when it came their time to read the Bible verse, well, that's a difficult bot. That's a difficult book to learn to read from. But it was that was very sustaining to me. Uh, the local NAACP at the time was very interested in that project, and I got to know the president at the time, Homer Smith, and Homer was a good community ally in getting things. Um, the other thing was we started four lecture series, and I'm still very proud of those. I went to one last week, and it was it's called the McFadden Lecture, and it was Tahanisi Coates, and it was, you know, standing, well, it was packed, and he was wonderful, and it was the 41st McFadden Lecture, and I did the very first one 41 years ago with Saul Bellow as the, as the author. Then we started the business lecture series, which had Louis Rukeyser, uh, William F. Buckley, the African American history lecture series, Maya Angelou, Shirley Chisholm, Henry, Henry Louis Gates, Skip Gates. I mean, it was just a wonderful chance to get to meet people and show them Indianapolis. Uh, they were probably the easiest guests to deal with because they just were curious about the town and you know take us to take us to bad neighborhoods <laughs> you know, they were but that was a good series and then we started the African American History Committee which was custodians clerks librarians myself uh, and we just did a lot of activities things that would focus on the local black history. Uh, and then we, about the third year, we decided to do something called Meet the Artist. And there was not a big venue in town for black art. But we started, the first year, I got into trouble with the fire marshal because I had so many people in the auditorium at the Central Library. We made it a party where we had good soul food. and But it was packed. Now, this last year, there were 2,000 people at the opening, and then the art is at the Central Library for a month. Several of the branches have started doing similar things, so they're now, you could name about 10 local artists just if you'd been attending those for several years and gotten a sense of their style, and I hope, and I know some of them have gone on and made good money uh, with their art, so those are the things that I guess I'm the proudest of, and of course then it spins off into the ACLU and the Democratic Party. and Right, because you say you're certainly a very well-known advocate and activist in this community, but you just explained to me on a very personal level why I now, I now understand why you have more black friends than I do. <laughs> That's not true. <laughs> when I look at that, when you share with me all of these um, programs and activities that you started, specifically with the goal of having a broader, diverse oh, audience. Absolutely. It explains then how you met everybody in town. Because, I mean, everybody, black and white, knows who you are. And they're saying, this is the first time that I've understood why, because you've named some organizations and some people that I know to be black civic leaders mm -hmm. um, and elected officials. So um, that's a, a, a great uh, way of sharing something that's often said with regard to the fact that if white people and black people just sat down and talked to each other, they'd realize that they'd have more in common than they had differently because of intersections with interests and that they could be friends. And um, so I, that, I'm glad that well, that's come out in the context okay. of your story sharing. Okay. Uh, story sharing. Well, I want to go... Okay. Go ahead. No, I want to go to your to, to also the intersection back with the um, Indiana Civil Liberties Union. Mm -hmm. You opened by saying that you were a gay woman and you'd had a partner of long standing. And I know right now in the national landscape, of course, is the fact that there was at least a victory with regard to marriage equality. Mm -hmm. uh, were you active in, was Indiana Civil Liberties Union active in the marriage equality fight that went on, or the fight for marriage equality went on nationally 
um, were you active with them at that time? This is going to be, talk about something challenging and whether I handled it well, I don't know. I was president of the ACLU of Indiana when we filed the first marriage equality suit. And the... The first one in the nation? No, well, the first for, one for, for Indiana. Indiana. Okay. And the national organization was not terribly happy with it coming out of Indiana. They wanted it coming out of a more progressive state. So we had to make sure that they asked that we make sure the board, the both the Inc. board for ACLU and the ACLU Foundation board both voted to accept this case, which they did unanimously. And then we started getting feedback and hostile feedback from local leaders in the gay community. And they felt that it was being done hastily, that it was going to have a backlash in Indiana, and there was a community meeting, and I represented the ACLU of Indiana with the executive director, and it was very hateful um, in terms of, you know, why are you doing this? Why didn't you ask us what we wanted done? Well, there were several LGBT people on both boards, so I really felt we had represented the community well. Um, and I, I remember after that meeting, I was standing on a porch and I said to a friend, I said, I think I've just been scared straight. I said, you know, it just... I get scared straight. <laughs> you know, it's like, whoa, if these are, these are my... But in time, it moves so quickly. When I think back on it, uh, things that I never thought would happen in my lifetime, uh, one, a black president, changes in LGBT rules and regulations and public opinion. And part of it was just saying, you need to get to know someone. I mean, when you were talking about the black-white, you know, it's also, it was like, guy invite a gay person to dinner. I mean, it wasn't quite that crass, but it was close. And I certainly learned a lot of people learned a, a lot of new people from those experiences. Uh, before we finish, I do want to talk about our friendship and how we have gotten to know each other over time and the things you've done for me that let me, and I don't even know if I've ever told you about one of them, and that was when I went to Washington, D.C. and came into Nashville and you picked me up and we went to a funeral at Arlington, and I was particularly worried about some issues with our mutual friend's family. And you just said, you know, Kathy, quit worrying about it. Let it be. Don't, don't keep struggling with this. It's okay. You don't have to be dear friends with everyone in his family. And some of us, even if we think we're strong, we do need permission sometimes for people to say, oh, come off it. You've done all you can do. And I remember that was the first time I felt that I really got to know you and enjoyed that so much. And of course, since the, <laughs> it was like you know, a group of us separated at birth, you know, then, but my friends are so j jealous that I do have a community of friends that includes so much diversity. Uh, Faye and I have our favorite story. It was just a terrible experience. I mean, it, it was funny, but we were at a luncheon, and this woman that I didn't know that well looked at me, and she pointed to Faye, and she says, where did you find her? I would just love to have a good black friend. And another woman at the table says, oh, probably Craigslist. Uh, <laughs> You know, could you be any bolder or brazen than that? But the woman was in organizations that did have mixed, you know, it, they were not lily white organizations, as so many are. But, you know, it's like, you're going to have to put a little little effort into this. I mean, it's, it's not a Craigslist situation. With the interview with Faye yesterday, um, she was telling, sharing one of her stories uh, about her because uh, I asked her, uh, given the recent death of Senator Richard Luger oh, and yes. the services that were held 
in Indianapolis this past week and knowing that she had such a history with Ten. Senator Luger that went back 65 years. Yes. And uh, I had the opportunity to ask her about that in context with her activism, mm -hmm. which took off in the 60s. Right. And her response was that it actually started with Richard Luger when he was on the school board. Mm -hmm. And that, they, that that's how they became friends, because mm -hmm. they were first adversaries. Um, and she said, but they found common ground. Yes. And, that, and she said that she knew where he ate lunch every day, which was at a, at a cafeteria, the hospital cafeteria. And so she made <laughs> a point of going over there um, and, and sitting down at his table to engage him in conversation around an issue with the, mm -hmm. with the school, school board policies. Mm -hmm. And then she subsequently asked him to go to lunch. And I said, oh, is that where your mantra, take a white man to lunch, came from? <laughs> well, I'm reminded of that now as you're talking because you're saying, you know, this the lady who made the comment mm -hmm. about she'd like to have a nice black like friend, <laughs> like Faith, right. right, you know, whatever. And somebody said, yeah, we'll just advertise on Craigslist. <laughs> and you're saying, really, it's as simple as just ask Asking. someone in your organization that's black to go to lunch with you. Right. Get to know them. Right. And you certainly are, are well known for hosting dinner parties just to get to know people. <laughs> and that's another way that it can be done. And that's a, that's a great strategy. With the, I want to go back because this has now raised my curiosity. The lawsuit that the Indiana Civil Liberties Union bought, brought before the court here in Indiana mm -hmm. uh, for marriage equality. What happened with it? <sighs> that is such a good question. It was not successful that first round. Okay. But then next, and the next group was uh, HRC, the Human Rights they came back into Indiana with some different clients, and it finally was successful in Indiana. Now, we were not the first mm -hmm. um, by any means, but it has, and it was, um, it was just a wonderful day. And the funny thing was, some of the people who had been most opposed to the ACLU filing the suit were first in line to get married. <laughs> and that just tickled me no end. <laughs> when I saw the pictures on TV and I thought, well, they got used to the idea. <laughs> you know, they, which, and they benefited. Right, and they benefited. So well, It's interesting because the thought I had, and, and certainly as we started this conversation, which is our interview, it's just a conversation, you've now, I now I have another question that never would have been even a part of this okay. conversation which is when you said that there was pushback even within the LGBT community to Indiana Civil Liberties Union filing That's suit right. for marriage equality in the right. state of Indiana. So that essentially it was your own community, your own peers that were challenging you, questioning you, uh, you know, really upset about it. Later they came around, they benefited from it. Mm -hmm. But do you believe that that was the start of what we see, what we saw come out of Indiana in the form of a vice president, Mike Pence, who as governor was very vocal about his opposition to same-sex marriage. Now he has a national stage and he's using it again to uh, for everything that, at least here in Indianapolis, I know there's still signs all over town and yards to say Pence must go. Mm -hmm. uh, but what, 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 did you ever have any interaction with with he or his staff, did they did the political side get into any conversations or confrontations with the Indiana Civil Liberties Union over over the the legal the legal action to to get uh, marriage equality? There there were a few informal meetings where people met for dinner or had conversation. It certainly did activate Pence and similar groups to come up with the, what is it called, RIFRA, religious, it's one where the business leaders in the state finally came out and said, this is, you know, this is crazy. We're not going to be able to attract the client, the, the workers we need if you're going to be this bigoted and this biased and this hateful. Um, but those... So the business community quieted down the political community. Right. Wow. Well, uh, to some extent, and but there was a picture of the signing of that bill that did pass the Indiana legislature, no surprise, but there was a signing, and the picture got out, and got out on national media, and it was the religious right 
the Catholic Church. Uh, he, it was all religious leaders that he had around the table as he was signing signing the bill. And so when that got out, people realized um, that, you know, he had his own built-in audience and he was passing that far. Mm -hmm. But the business community really, <clears throat> more than the political community, I mean, they're, in the state legislature, there is so little, there's so much, it's so dominated by Republicans that you almost, the Chamber of Commerce can be as helpful to your cause in terms of public perception. Um, it was a hard time, but it the popular sentiment, and I, even with the current political situation, what I see on mainstream television, what I see on cable, what I see in movies, what I read in books, the company, the country has moved on. Mm -hmm. it's like, we're, they're not debating those things anymore. They may be in certain places, but... You were, right. Well, you know, and you sort of crossed that other boundary that I wanted to talk about, which was your work and activism on the political side. Mm -hmm. um, you've been very active in political campaigns. You've been active with the, the <laughs> Mary County Democratic Party. When we look at the national landscape, are you pleased with what you're seeing as the field of candidates on the Democratic side, which I think now numbers 25 or 26? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm trying not to pick a favorite I'm just waiting. I want to see. I'll I'll support any of the ones. I mean, there's no one there that I said there's no way in hell I'm going to do that for that candidate. There's some I prefer more than others, but no, whatever happens, you know, I'm saving my money until it, the field gets a little. So so yes. So again, when we roll everything up about your wow your pathway to becoming an advocate and an activist, it seems like it was born of multiple experiences. Yes. And in the end, we could say, wow, you know, the Indiana Civil Liberties Union, the Mayor's Task Force on LGBTQ, um, the um, <clears throat> library, and the Indiana Literacy, I know about that program. I did not know that that start of it was with with well, Indiana Reed. Mm -hmm. um, and I didn't know the start of it was with the library system, mm -hmm. but that makes a lot of sense. Sure. So I would just say, what else would you say that you consider very fulfilling as you look at over your shoulder and in the rearview mirror that you that you've done, or even people you've done things with? You've been, a, you know, it's, I think a great leader is somebody who's also a great follower, and you get a lot of credit for always being a great supporter and a great follower as well. Well, I what other that. efforts have you? that have you helped fuel, that have made a difference? Okay. I live, and this is probably too local, but I live in an amazing neighborhood. And the, the cohesion and the respect and the taking care of that happens in my two blocks makes me very proud. I mean, it just, we, we can get together. It is, they're gay couples, they're people of color, uh, you know, African American, Asian, I mean Indian, and it is, and we finally got more children, and that's been the old, the people in the neighborhood. Rather than move, they, every house has got some room added on, and I have really enjoyed at that level, just being able to meet new people and know that I have people who are looking out for me. Um, in terms of What's happening locally? I am very impressed with what the Central Indiana Community Fund is trying to do in terms of equity and saying, yes, we've always helped minority organizations, but it's been from the perspective of what white people thought they needed. And they're trying, and they've made several good hires. They're really changing the focus of what they're going to be doing. And I want to reach out and started that effort to that organization to say, you tell me what you need. I mean, I want to help in any way. Uh, and I'd like to help more than just leaving you a small amount of money in my will. 
but you know, I think I can bring some people together at the table, and I hope it's the dining room table, you know, where over food, where we can just talk as a group about things that could could happen, or and dream big. It's, so now you're speaking of um, all of the support that's needed in the world of philanthropy, and your 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 way is stepping in to, I think, facilitate conversations. Yes, I would like to about do about the Central Indiana Fund, which is a one of the largest givers of grants uh, uh, and other monies to help mm -hmm. support cause oriented right um, issues and purposes and programs. Uh, I, that's good to hear. No one has ever talked about that uh, in any of the interviews that I've done. Really? So uh, that's good. So again, it reminds me of something else I talk about uh, in the context of these interviews and what and this, what stories we want Trailblazers Impact to bring out, which is that women who retire in order to refire, mm -hmm. that women don't retire to quit. They, they retire to put more effort into things that they're passionate about. So are there anything, other things in your retirement years that you're passionate about right now, even though it sounds like you've got quite a full plate? <laughs> well, a totally different level, and this is not a trailblazer. I am, I am a very good gardener. <laughs> I really, that I love. Uh, I love working in the yard and that kind of thing. I've been reading a lot about older women recently. Uh, there's a book that's just come out fairly recently, and it's 55 Underemployed and Faking Normal, A Guide to a Better Life. It's by Elizabeth White. And I was not aware that so many, particularly some women, have, they've taken their entire savings to do a business. And then they find out that it, it didn't work. And what do they do then for that, that next to last and last act? And there are lots of things in this book, and I find, I've not finished it, but I just find there are things that are worth thinking about and some realities I was not aware of in terms of, well, I knew that we, none of us were saving as much for retirement as we should, but this one's pretty dire. And then the other one is Women Rowing North. You can see the librarian always has to, by Mary, it's P-I-P-H-E-R, Pipper, I'm guessing. Navigating Life's Currents and Flourishing as We Age. I've loaned it to several friends, and they always act like, well, why would you give it to me? Because you're 70, damn it, and you might want to you know, look at some of this. But it, it was, it's a, she's a psychotherapist, and I usually stay away from those kinds of things. But that was, it was, it was worthwhile to me to read it, just to think about uh, the worst thing that could happen would be saying, well, I'm on a downward spiral. No, <laughs> I may be, but I don't want to acknowledge it. And, you know, so. Well, yeah, we're coming toward to the close of the interview, and I always close by asking, is there a particular piece of advice uh, or strategy you'd like to pass on to younger professional women who are still in their, defining their trajectory? But because you're a librarian, and I know that just like there's no such thing as a retired minister, there's really no such thing as a retired librarian. Never. <laughs> My closing question for you was going to be, were there any books that you would recommend that our listeners uh, <clears throat> should be reading? And you you jumped the gun. You've already, you've already you pulled them out. You had them here on the table. Would you re please restate okay. the name of those two books and the okay. authors? Sure. 55, and it's the numbers, numeral, 5-5, five, five, comma, Underemployed and Faking Normal, Your Guide to a Better Life by Elizabeth White. Elizabeth spent most of her career at the World Bank, but then decided she wanted to put her own, she put she and her mother went into business with African decorative items, store in New York, Pittsburgh, no, Philadelphia and D.C. And they lost their shirt, basically. I mean, and here she is starting again, and she's saying, I'm not the only one. There's so many people out there that have been in this situation. And then the other one, much lighter in many ways, but Women Rowing North by Mary P-I-P-H-E-R, Navigating Life's Currents and Flourishing as We Age. Uh, it's not, it's, it's a good read. You know, there'll be, you may not, Every situation you might not agree, might not identify with, but there'll be plenty that you will. 
then one of the things you've been big on is what kind of advice would we pass on? And I have two, one, one for two. Um, learn the rules so you know how to break them. Uh, forgiveness is much easier to obtain than permission. And I've broken a lot of rules. I, in, I think, but um, I usually didn't get much more than a slap on the hand. The other thing that I really, this is just a life way of living, is if you don't get two good laughs a day, you aren't paying attention. <laughs> I, just, <laughs> I just end up laughing over things that maybe are inappropriate, but still, it's the best medicine. It really is. Well, thank you for one one good nugget that I just took from your three closing pieces of advice, which is learn how to break the rules. Learn the rules learn first. Learn the rules. Learn the rules first. So you know, so how, you to know break. how to break them. Right. right. And then you said, and, it, and that makes sense, that if you know how to break the rules, then you can do it in a way that can minimize the, um, the outcome. Collateral damage. Then the collateral damage, right. And, you know, and now you make me think in context of all the trailblazers that I know across the country. And I'm sure every one of them would agree that somewhere along the way, there was a rule that they broke. And we're still breaking rules in America, which is what makes America. Absolutely. Uh, so thank you, Kathy, so much. And I am almost positive I will be circling back to you in a future season <laughs> to do a follow-up interview. Uh, but thank you and uh, for one, uh, not only the long history of being a trailblazer, but continuing to be a trailblazer and letting other women know that, <clears throat> what do you say, rowing, uh, rowing north, women rowing, We're rowing north, north. 70, yep. rowing north. Yes, uh, you know, that, you, look, we just, we just keep on keeping on. I hope you've enjoyed listening to another story of the impact of trailblazers. Visit our website at trailblazersimpact.com and connect with us at hello at trailblazersimpact.com. Remember, you must learn a new way to think before you can master a new way to be.